It is Mock Draft Monday, and today we're talking about some of our favorite options for the Chargers in round two, including Zach Frazier, who could be the Chargers center of the future. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Locked On Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. We've been covering the Chargers together now for eight seasons, but this is our sixth year as the host of the Locked On Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you to the everydayers out there for making us your first listen today. And to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe or follow for free on the Locked On Chargers YouTube channel and listen wherever you get your podcast from. David, what do we got today? Daniel, it's time to do our Mock Draft Monday, getting into our favorite second round options, taking it a little bit further. Zach Frazier, the center from West Virginia, looks like a plug-and-play starter, a guy I would love to see in the middle of the Chargers offensive line. Troy Franklin is a speedster, a straight-up vertical threat, a lot to like there, and Braden Fisk was the combine darling. His RES score will blow your mind. Yeah, very, very athletic. And I mean, what's a mock draft season if we're not talking about the Chargers getting a speedy receiver? And how long has it been since they really invested into that defensive line, right? Maybe a changing of the guard in that situation with the new regime coming in. But today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks. If your bet wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. David, we did something similar to this last year, getting into our mock draft Mondays, and we'll get into, you know, one and two and three round mocks later on. But we really want to just try to get to as many of the most likely prospects as we possibly can. And we have a good batch today to talk about, including a prospect that would make a ton of sense, especially with where the Chargers roster sits right now. And that is West Virginia center Zach Frazier, who is a guy who looks the part, plays really well. I mean, and the fit makes a ton of sense with the Chargers. The Chargers right now, without Corey Lindsley, with him 99% likely to retire, they need their center of the future, and it feels like this could be the dude. Yeah, not not only is Corey Lindsley most likely retiring, Will Clapp is also a free agent, so he's probably going to be gone, and I'm sure the Chargers probably want to get some new blood in there at the center position. And also, realistically, Jackson Powers Johnson is probably not going to be there in the second round. Right. He's probably a surefire first rounder. So you have to look at some realistic options, and I think that's why this brought us to Zach Frazier. Yeah, and I mean, I think for the Chargers, it's interesting because as of right now, if they went into the draft, they would need their starter, right? We just saw over the weekend someone like Bradley Bozeman gets released, someone who has Greg Roman ties, so maybe they try to get the starter in free agency if they can find a way to make the money work. The madness but as begins of right today. Now, yeah, and I mean, who knows you know, where kind of their priority level would be for it, but when you're looking at someone like Zach Frazier, if you're saying, hey, you're going into the draft, you need a center, you have to come away with a starting center, I'd be pretty thrilled about someone like Zach Frazier being the long-term Corey Lindsley, you know, replacement. Because I think the other big part is he really fits, I think, what the Chargers want to do offensively. I think he's physical enough for that. I think he would fit nicely in a Greg Roman style of offense and a Greg Roman rushing attack. Because I think we saw last year without Corey Lindsley, Obviously, the pass protection was a lot worse with him not being there to point out protections and being that anchor in the middle of the line. But also, yeah. the running game was devastated by not having that guy in the middle that can coordinate everything and really be that connector because that is what the center position is, especially in the running game. The good news is, is Zach Frazier would come in and would fill a lot of those holes and a lot of the things you were missing when you got most of a season of Will Clapp. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Zach Frazier out of West Virginia, six foot two, three 306 pounds. 800 plus snaps and 12 plus games in three straight seasons so yeah i mean this guy is on the field a lot he is a phenomenal pass protector only four sacks allowed and 1361 pass blocking snaps that's as good as it is probably going to get he is very athletic he's agile he's light on his feet for a very large man has a very sturdy anger, and I think he did a really good job of being able to, to take on the drive of power rushes. And like I said, he's just rock solid in, in pass protection. I think he's a guy that, you know, if you want to pull your center, if you want to get him on the move, if you want to get him as a lead blocker in front of guys, he can do a lot of damage in those situations. I mean, this is a guy that 
on quite frankly it was really hard to to find kind of any negatives in his game uh this is a uh, to me a pro ready starting caliber center that you take and you plug and play right away yeah i i don't have much as far as just obvious defects and in, in the technique and things like that that he uses obviously not an offensive line expert but we've gone through a few offensive line classes we've seen a ton of prospects we've seen guys who look like Rashawn Slater and are ready to go day one. And we've seen other guys who need a lot more work. And he definitely feels like he is the prior in this conversation because, I mean, the dude looks like he could come in and start for the Chargers on day one. The things I like the most about him, it always felt like he was really well balanced. You didn't mm. see him, like, a lot of times with some offensive line, you see him just on the ground way too much. Yeah. But, and the other big thing, too, is, like, plays with great leverage that's yeah. something we always talk about especially with tackles and things like that it's always we get on here collegiate offensive or defensive linemen it's like they don't keep their pad level yeah down, they're too right? high yeah they're this too is tall. a dude who always plays with good leverage and i think yeah. another really impressive thing to me is just has the upper body strength and the torque to be able to turn guys in running plays right where you're able to get guys out of the good hole point. you need to run through and i think a big part of that is him being a four-time state wrestling champ and that is such a big thing he's yeah. not a mauler in the you know way that you see some guys being road graders but what he is is a master of leverage he knows yeah. how to use your leverage against you he knows That's how to get you going it is it's just a different style right i mean you, you do want guys and i think you know in short yarded situations and things like that i thought he did very well to get the push that he needed it's not yeah. like he lacks in that way but you can see where that wrestling background comes into play and when he gets a hold of you his i mean he really does have vice grips like he will stick and play through a play he'll finish a block He'll hold yeah. on to the block through the whistle. And I just think that he's a very, very well-made prospect. I mean, like, I think that if you are really trying to grasp for straws and look for some cons here, I think the biggest thing, David, is just that he broke his leg in November, but it almost becomes like a positive because he was already out at the combine doing some drills. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, hey, whenever you take a player and, and you want to plug him and play him and make him your starter, obviously you want to look at the medicals. That, that has to be clean. I mean, a broken leg, I think that's something that's pretty common. Uh, that's an injury we've seen a lot. We've seen players break their legs, come back, and, and heal just fine. So, obviously, you just want to make sure that that's not going to be something that has any kind of long-term effects as far as, you know, him being able to do his job. But, you know, besides that, I mean, this is a guy that is really, really exciting for me because we've seen it. We've seen how important the center position is. I feel like in years past, I didn't really understand the value of it. But now that you had you had the you know the pleasure, we've had the pleasure of being able to watch Corey Lindsley. We, we've seen the the level of play and how that can affect everybody around the you know everyone and honestly anyone on the football field in the running game in the passing game. It's extremely important to have a high quality center. Uh, I think that's the the general, the commander, the center of your offensive line. So investing a premium pick to get one and have a really good feeling about it, I think is something the Chargers absolutely should do. Yeah, and that's kind of the tricky thing is you don't want to pigeonhole yourself into having to take a, you know, a starting center in this draft. But it's going to be hard to pass up on a guy like this if he's available. I know I do think there's some guys, you know, if you wanted to go short-term replacement in free agency, there's some guys later on in the draft that I'm sure we'll get to at some point. That might be more, hey, you don't need them to start right away, but they can turn into something. This is a guy that feels like, hey, if you need a plug-and-play starter, if you need a dude who is going to help you change the culture of the offensive line, this is a dude that fits all of those things. I mean, I understand taking a guy who broke his leg as Charger fans is something that's really scary. To me, it's more of a freak thing, right? Like. Yeah repeated torn acls and repeated soft tissue injuries and stuff like that like the dude broke his leg because on a game winning drive in the last game of the season he was there pushing the pile and got his legs caught up under a pile and to save them a 10 second runoff he bear crawled with two arms and one leg and then hopped off the field on one foot so they in, in his what last collegiate game right like and beast. that's that those are the things that you know just make me it's like hey if they if they want to do this if they go this direction if he's there I fully sign off on it. Take him yeah. with your second round pick. Get your center of the future. I love this guy as a prospect. But I also love Justin Herbert, which is why we go into every year, seeing if we can get the Chargers to add more weapons around him, including a vertical threat that is someone that, you know, is worthy of the golden arm that we know Justin Herbert has. And we got one today. If the Chargers wait till the second round and they want a speedy receiver, Troy Franklin, someone from Justin Herbert's alumni, might be there to be taken. So we're going to talk about Troy Franklin and some more second round prospects and more on today's Locked On Chargers podcast. First though, I do want to tell you guys about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience 
What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts that you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, David, well, let's get into another prospect here because when we were going into the second round, we have some more guys that we didn't even get to talk to. I mean, another receiver that could be there with Michigan ties, Roman Wilson. I'm sure we'll get to him at some point. You know, I'm sure we'll look at some defenders like we will in the next segment with Braden Fisk because the Chargers are definitely going to have to invest into the defensive side early and often in this draft no as well. But one of the guys that popped out as far as that, hey, if the Chargers go a different direction, say they trade back and take a tackle or a corner in round one, what would they do in round two? Would they still try to get that receiver for Justin Herbert? Because as we've talked about with this receiving core, David, after the 2024 season, the only two guys under contract are Quentin Johnston and Darius Davis. Yeah. So a receiver makes sense. And then when you're talking about who we're talking about today, wide receiver Troy Franklin from Oregon, I think the fit makes a lot of sense too because Justin Herbert, the one main thing he's been needing is one consistent deep ball threat. Quentin Johnston, that was not really his game in college. Mike Williams is the closest thing Justin Herbert's had as someone that was just a different kind of downfield threat because you could throw it up to him in any situation. This guy and Troy Franklin we're talking about today is a legit downfield burner speed threat. That is kind of what Justin Herbert's been missing. Yeah, he, he certainly has been missing him. And, you know, when you look at the construction of the wide receiver room right now, uh, there's a couple of guys that are probably going to be leaving that room. Mike Williams, you just talked about the high likelihood he's probably going to be traded or cut. Uh, then you look at Jalen Guyton, who is the other speed guy, came off of an ACL uh, tear and just wasn't really super productive last year. Just didn't no. really feel like that same chemistry was there, which is sad because some of the best throws uh, have been to Jalen Guyton from Justin Herbert and catching those deep bombs. So yeah. you definitely want to have somebody who has that vertical threat, who has that ability to go up and get the football because we know Justin Herbert can throw it a country mile. Absolutely. And I think, he, like you said, even in this year's wide receiver room, I think he fits well because yeah. I think, you know, Quentin Johnston, he's not a beat, you know, press man coverage, get past somebody, stack a DB and catch a deep ball. It's just not what his game is. Right. And I think, yeah. you know, with his frame, it's harder for him to get off the line of scrimmage and he struggled with that a lot. This is someone that whether you put him in the slot or on the outside, because you've seen him extended time in both of those positions. He can get deep. He can take the top off of coverage. I mean, the 4 4 one forty is nothing to sneeze at. I mean, just because it's not 4-3 doesn't mean it's not fast. That's very, very yeah. fast. Yeah. And obviously, the proven downfield production is something, you know, 14 touchdowns don't happen by accident. This no. dude put up a monster season at Oregon. I definitely see what the hype is all about. I think he's kind of a guy who's a little polarizing as far as, like, big boards and, and where guys have him going. But like, hey, you know, this is a dude who can get past the DB. He stacks DBs very well. He tracks the football well down the field. He can make the contested catches and make over-the-shoulder ball-tracking type of catches. And I think he also has pretty good instincts as far as just sitting down versus zone coverage. And also, David, being able to react to the quarterback, especially on scrambles. And when things break down, that's when he's at his best. And we haven't really seen Justin Herbert with that kind of receiver. Yeah, he's excellent at that. I mean, he really does a really good job of being a friendly target to the quarterback and just continuously trying to work to try to get open f yeah. when his quarterback is in trouble. So I saw that repeatedly when I was watching him, and, I, and obviously I enjoyed that. Troy Franklin, six foot, three hundred eighty-seven pounds, so he's got some pretty good size. I like the way he created separation from press. He has a really good, strong like jab step. His footwork, his footwork is good. He uses the footwork to try to get open off the line and kind of get those releases free. He needs that if he's going to go hunt down the football field. Um, also, I think he stays locked into the defender's pads when he's run blocking, which I liked. Obviously, when you're looking at a Jim Harbaugh-led uh, offense, you know, there's going to be a lot of running. You want to have to make sure that your wide receivers are able to run block. I mean, that's a part of you know, of uh, getting that that done. Um, like you yeah. said, he does a good job of tracking the ball over his shoulder. Uh, and this is a big-time vertical threat. I mean, you said 14 touchdowns, 17.1 yards per reception, too. So this is a, a guy who, 
has a ton of deep yards, uh, and he can definitely go up and get it. And that is yeah. something that we know is valuable in the Chargers offense. It is, and they don't have a guy that's like him. And I think the other nice thing about his game is he knows that he's a speed receiver, and I think he uses that to his advantage. Like I think the deceleration on the comeback routes, getting DBs to open up their hips and think they have to carry him down the field just to cut it off and go back to the quarterback he usually does a pretty good job of doing that. And I think the other thing, too, decent after the catch. Like I, he, there's, He's not the guy I think that is a creator after the right. catch as far as you know making a bunch of people miss. But I do think he can maximize, you know, his opportunities there. Almost seven yards. He can run past after, you for sure. Seven yards after the catch per catch, per, you know, last season. So, I mean, someone that's pretty decent at that, it wouldn't necessarily be his game. They did run him on a lot of wide receiver screens and things like that. I just think he also just does a really good job of setting defensive backs up. He has a really good change of tempo and does, you know, I think has some of those more crafty parts of his game as well. When you talk about things that he struggled with, the reasons, you know, he's not a first round pick and we're talking about him in the second round. To me, uh, you know, I think he has a good release package, but I do think that if he did go up against more physical defensive backs and they did get their hands on him at the line of scrimmage, he had a hard time separating past that. It definitely yeah. slowed him down. It threw off the timing. And I think that's because he weighs 176 pounds. So that's what he wore to the weight of the con combine. He was 6'1.7, so just under 6'2. 176 pounds is something that's we seen more now, right? It's after you see the Zay Flowers and guys like that right. and some of the wider receivers, it's not the death sentence that it used to be. And I would say, to me, wasn't super as impactful as a blocker, but I think there's potential there. You know, if he gains yeah. some weight, fills out that frame a little bit. It's just like, can he fill out that frame and keep the speed, right? So I think yeah. those those are the things you're kind of having to, to weigh when you're taking someone like this. So a lot of good things, David, and then some things that, you know, are a little setbacks as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I didn't see a lot of like side to side wiggle. I, I mean, he's not he's not that type of, of guy. He's not the the uh, stop and start creator, in, in my opinion. Um, I don't think he had a super extensive route tree, just because he was mostly a vertical guy. So I think that's something that he could probably you know work on at the next level is just adding to his route tree. And and like you said, you know, you could add a little bit of weight and strength. I mean, hopefully he's a, able to put on a, a couple of pounds, so he's a little bit more competitive in those, you know, one-on-one -on -one, man to man situations where he's going to have to, you know, put up with being mugged for the first five year, five yards of the play. So he's going to have to be able to get off the line of scrimmage. And then one of the things that you brought up, uh, you know, I think that's important to mention is nine drops. I mean, I thought the hands were good when I watched him. Um, but uh, I guess, you know, when you, when you look at the stats last year, he did have nine drops. Uh, so, I mean, some concentration drops in there. Uh, I thought he caught with his hands for the most part. Yeah. Um, but nine drops is definitely a little bit alarming. That's something after watching Quentin Johnston and the, yeah. the drop issues that he had, I don't know how, uh, that's going to go on, uh, go by a charger fans getting another receiver that might have a little bit of issues with the hands. Yeah, and when you have, you know, 81 catches, like, you, it's just a lot of opportunities, too. Yeah, right? yeah, you got to aggregate that, yeah. Had 1,383 receiving yards. I, I mean, I, I think what gives me a little bit of solace there is he only had two drops in 2022 and, and played, you know, a full season that year. So I, it's not as if it's been something that has plagued him his entire career. Yeah, not a chronic But he did have a really bad drop against Utah over the yeah, shoulder yeah. ball trying to adjust to it. Would have been a touchdown. And then another one later on in that game where, you know, just – out to the short flat. pass you yeah. know looking up field before he fully brought it in yeah. and just balanced off of him so i think that it's not as concerning but obviously as we saw with quentin johnson like hey if that's something that happens and then it starts happening early in the season it can turn into something much oh, more snowball. where it's just no the question. monster that's keeping you up at night so this guy would fill a role, right? You could see oh, yeah. what he would have a role, even in his rookie season, how he could help this offense out and how he kind of fills a need the Chargers don't really have right now. He is legit downfield vertical threat, which is something, you know, maybe some people hoped Quentin Johnston could be, but was never really his game. Someone like Darius Davis, a little too small to be that for this team yeah. and not what Quentin John or not what Keenan Allen and Josh Palmer's games are. So you definitely see how he would fit this team, whether the Chargers be willing to spend a second round pick. Who knows? And, you know, well, I think it'll have a lot to do with what they end up doing in the first round. But one of the positions the Chargers just have not put enough resources in, in my opinion, and really tried to cover it with Band-Aids 
is the defensive line. I mean, and don't bring Jerry Tillery to me to something as far as resources spent on defensive linemen. But we have a guy here, I think, that has a ton of juice, like literally, metaphorically, however you figuratively. The next guy we're talking about in Braden Fist has a lot of juice, and it is time for the Chargers to invest in their defensive line. So we're going to get into that and more on today's Locked on Chargers podcast. First, though, I do need to tell you guys about FanDuel because you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. And you guys, it's March. We know what time it is. The biggest tournament and maybe all of sports outside of maybe like the World Cup, which only happens every four years, is coming up. It's time to dance. And whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who is going to win it all and cut down the nets at the very end. But it is truly one of the best times of the year to bet on sports. To me, it's, it should be almost a national holiday. If you can get one of those days covered from your job so you can sit home and just watch the best thing, the pureness of college basketball in this do or die tournament they have coming up. So just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. David, I want to get into another prospect here that should be available when the Chargers pick at 37. According to Jordan Reed from ESPN's latest mock draft, all of these guys were still available when the Chargers picked at 37. If you go to these mock draft simulators, feels like you can make just about anything happen. You know you have. <laughs> yeah, of course, but like, just feel it doesn't feel realistic yeah right? when yeah. you see someone with the the pedigree of someone like a jordan reed and it's like okay this is how he thinks it's going to play out plus knowing kind of what teams need and things like that and as a human not just ai or whatever right. those things are going off of yeah it means a little bit more and that's you know what we're trying to go to and looking at big boards and things is just for us hey which guys should be available for the charge to pick that are realistic and Braden fisk of florida state feels like someone that could be realistically there with the 37th overall pick even after his freakish combine like you talked about earlier but just as far as the fit goes why the Chargers would take a defensive lineman in, in the second round and to me David it's just about what the message is from this coaching staff from this new regime from Joe Hortiz to Jim Harbaugh something that's been preached throughout the entire offseason since those guys took over building in the trenches and since Tom Telesco took over David in 2013 the Chargers have only picked a defensive tackle on days one or two of the draft twice it was Jerry Tillery and it was Justin Jones who was a third-round pick. So it's time to invest, and the Chargers should be doing it in this upcoming draft. Maybe that's Braden Fisk. Yeah, and and, and they have to. I mean, you just look at the numbers game and on the defensive line. They are have already got rid of a couple of guys. Sebastian Joseph Day got released, uh, and, of course, Austin Johnson is a free agent, so he's probably gone as well. So the Chargers need to add bodies to that room. They need to add impact to that room. Uh, they need to bring in guys that, that can stop the run, that, that can be a present. They just need more talent. They yeah. need an infusion of talent on that defensive line, and Braden Fisk could definitely be that, that guy. Yeah, right now, to me, the only guys that are probably locks for this roster and aren't cap casualties potentially – are Scott Matlock, a sixth round pick in 2023, and Tito Abonia, who's a fourth round pick from a few years ago. So, yeah. like, there's no, you know, starting experience really between those two guys. There's no extended, you know, success from either of those guys. Right. And I think for too long under Tom Telesco, this team just tried to find short term band aids, whether it was Brandon Mevane or Limbaugh Joseph, Austin Johnson, Sebastian, Day, the, Sebastian Joseph Day, the guys you brought up. And it's like, it's time to actually invest in it and, and find some good players there because the chargers did take you know had a few more flyers they send out like you said scott matlock tito abonia fourth and a sixth round pick respectively at the same time though it's like none of them were good like yeah. and those guys have time and we'll see what happens but like the chargers just have not been able to draft enough talent i mean darius phylon is like one of the last guys you can think about that they drafted who you know way outplayed what his draft position yeah. was as a sixth round pick but like that's a long, long time ago. There's some Chargers fans who probably don't even know that name right now. But let's talk about yeah. Braden Fisk specifically. And like I said, this is a dude who would bring some juice to this defensive line. And if you're just trying to add talent, if this is a guy that's like, okay, well, let's just take this kind of athletic freak and deploy him and give ourselves, I think, some more physicality and some more juice in that room. I mean, freakishly athletic is the first note that I had here. His RES score, uh, okay, this is out of 10, by the way. 9.97 okay <laughs> that's sixth highest ever uh, according to defensive linemen since they started res which 
spans over 30 years. So very high motor with a very quick first step. I think the, the things that I saw immediately showcased some good position flexibility as well. As well. In 2022, he played mostly uh, at defensive end. Uh, yeah. where he was on, on the outside, kind of over, uh, over the tackle. Um, on last year in 2023, he played more inside, um, but he was able to, to be able to show um, that he's able to do both of those positions and play them at a pretty high level. Ha also ha has some pretty good pass rush, uh, has six sacks in each of the last two seasons. So that's pretty good production for an, an interior defensive lineman. Obviously, you know, we saw with Morgan Fox, sacks get you paid in this league. So if yeah. you're able to provide some pass rush, uh, especially coming out of college, I think that's something that's something you have to pay attention to. And I think the thing with him is like he's big enough to not just be a, you know, rotational pass rusher. Like I, you wouldn't be taking him for that. It, yeah. He's six three and a half, two hundred and ninety two pounds, so right around three hundred pounds. So it's not at a super undersized defensive tackle by any means. Maybe if you were just specifically going to play him a nose tackle, yeah. that wouldn't be the way to go. But I think as far as what he brings to the table, he's super explosive off the snap, just to the point where you know he will rock you back and just plunge himself into you with reckless abandon at time. Oh yeah, plays with a ton of effort, a really good motor. He keeps fighting. I think he does a good job of locating the football. You know, you don't see him just get caught I agree up in with the that. watch too often. Like, he, he knows where it is, right? Yeah, like he, even if he spins around, he, he locates the, the ball carrier. He yeah. locates the ball carrier really well. Because a lot of times, like, you'll see defensive tackles that don't know the ball carriers pass them until the yeah. guy's seven yards downfield. Right. So and that was gone. something yeah. to me in watching him that I definitely had an appreciation for. And like you said, 12 sacks over the last two seasons. I think especially after, you know, transferring from a, a group of five school to florida state for one season as a yeah. sixth year senior it was impressive to me that he really had his best season against the best competition that he faced in his career so i think that if you're looking for what the pros are those are the things like super explosive can be very disruptive and then i think for me where you get off on the cons is i wish he didn't have 31 inch arms right in the in the in the brandon staley regime like that would have probably taken him off the Chargers board yeah. altogether. Yeah. And, and I wonder truly if he's a fit for what Jesse Minter wants to do. Obviously, we'll see, you know, but that I don't know if he's a gap control. Like, I think he's a slicing, you know, get in the backfield type. He's not really a stack blocks, shed guys, and then, you know, make tackles and control gaps. Even though I would say, you know, when I, I was expecting him to get kind of washed away by double teams at time, and I really thought he held his own and, and split him a good amount of times too for someone who's a little undersized. So there are some cons here, and I think it, it might be just a, a fit part as far as if the Chargers want to go this way. I think I'm with you uh, on that as well. I think it's just not the strongest guy on the field. He can get moved out of the way at times, and like you said, he did have some shorter arms. Um, yeah, 31 you know, inches is pretty yeah. darn short. Right. Yeah, 31 inch arms, and and yeah, I think the fit is the most important thing here. They want to bring toughness. They want to bring physicality. That is not necessarily Braden Fisk. Uh, so I mean, it, it might not be from that perspective. But I mean, hey, you need to have all different kinds of defense defensive linemen. You got to have guys that can you can mix and match. You're always rotating these guys, so you want to make sure that you have a good mix in that DL room. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought he was fine as far as physicality goes for me. I, I mean, I you know, if I, I don't know if Jesse Minter also wants a guy like Devondre Sweat, who's 365 pounds either, That's right? A monster. So we'll, we'll see as they fill out that room, you know, kind of what they're looking for when they actually have a choice. It's not just prospects and things right. like that. I think the other con would just be older prospect. He's going to be – he's 24 already. He was a yeah. sixth-year senior last year. To me, it's just can – can you trust him to be able to get off blocks uh, enough at the next level? Because to me, it's not just about getting off blocks. It's the tackle radius, yeah. right? He just uh, it has a much smaller tackle radius. And you saw him miss some sacks and some potential tackles because of that. So super athletic freak. If someone can find a way to deploy him correctly, I think he could be a very good player at the next level and someone who's super disruptive and is a hard man to block because of the quickness, because of the explosiveness, because of, I think he has, he has pretty good strength as far as just power of, you know, knocking guys backwards and collapsing the pocket. So I think a team will have a role for him. We'll see if the Chargers would want to go that direction. But that's going to wrap things up for today's show. The good news is we'll be back with you guys tomorrow, and things are really going to start to go down. It is the NFL legal tampering period. I almost guarantee you guys, by the time we're talking tomorrow, 
We're going to have some news on the Chargers front about how they're going to handle this offseason. So to make sure you don't miss it, go subscribe and follow for free on the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and listen wherever you get your podcast from. And you can also find me and David for our live reactions for all of our takes on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports for me and Drew Talk SD as these moves potentially start to go down. And we also post the show every day to at Lockdown LAC on Twitter as well, including on our Instagram at Locked on Chargers and our Locked on Chargers Facebook page. So make sure you guys are back here tomorrow because stuff is starting to go down and this week is going to get crazy quickly. But until then, guys, take it easy and go Bolts.